Morning guys, I've um, just been having a little bit of interesting to talk this morning to one of the people I know out there who's uh, very much the uh, a uh, one of, we'll just say he's a, a first responder and um, he confirmed a lot of what I've seen beforehand I and mean, specifically we'll just kind of point by point it. Uh, the first thing he just sort of suggested to me was that yes, um, police are, uh, are not wearing their face masks, they're infringing self-isolation points, which again, just, you know, I, I see it on Facebook pages, I've seen it when the police are, are, are wandering around uh, where I am in Karatani in town, um, other people are showing me saying the same thing, so it, it's not on off report, we're seeing a general culture, um, we're even getting confirmation writing from the police saying, no, no, we're not really, you know, worrying about the whole process, we're trying to be careful, um, but yes, we go home, take, you know, we go home, to our um, loved ones and we take all the people that we've visited out in the neighborhood and we take that back home and vice versa um and of course we're also seeing that, that that's that's cost for crossing the bar because of course the police are going to these events without actually having to work with different first responders and they're not showing that social distancing to those other first responders uh those first responders which include people like um fire services and paramedics um, instead of being paired up with a set team, which is you know kept in an isolation uh, bubble, which is what you're seeing what's happening with the um, specialists, which have been deployed to uh, places like Burnham and so on for the military, they're being you know isolated from the rest of the group because they you know they want those guys to they're going out into the community, so they're keeping them away from the rest of the, the Burnham military base, um, which is its own bubble in its own right. Uh, but that's not happening within the police or the paramedics who are having to every night work with different people and then go home to their families. So, and again, on top of that, he's confirming me that um, they're not getting all the equipment that they actually they need. Um, and that some of the equipment they're getting is actually quite frayed or uh, past its use by date. He also confirmed another thing for me, which is that uh, you know, I've been sitting there scratching my head going, well, wait a minute, you know, when I was when in the army, we had, you know, the Centre uh, for Strategic International Studies, and they pretty much all uh, emergency scenario, everything, and they've got another building in Wairu, all that stuff there, so there's like a book and a blueprint, and uh, he again confirmed that, yes, there was a, a book and a blueprint, um, and it's not being used, and that they've been training for this last two or three years, and again, what I've been saying about, you know, we've had the SARS epidemic, we've had the H1N1 epidemic, so we've had all these events come through, and all these experts tell us about it, and looks like you know there's been supposedly spending of stuff go down but when you go to the cupboard there's nothing in the cupboard which indicates that there is uh, what what comes to my mind is the case of michael swan down in dunedin who was employed by the dhb to put in software and it turned out in the end that he was putting it in his back pocket and no one noticed that this guy was turning up to work every morning in lamborghinis and phantom rolls royces and had 18 boats for some reason that all went over the head uh what a he was actually, I think he was one of David Clark's mates. And again, well, let's just have a quick dig there because, again, you know, what, what the frustration is, is that we are being given these uh, edicts on, on command. You must stay at home. It's very important. You can't go out. You can't go and get some, you know, food for your, for your um, go, out, go out fishing. Um, you can't go out into woods and do some hunting uh, because you might hurt yourself and we can't send the emergency services. And yet... Having sent this message and really hammered at home, we've had Mike Bush, you know, telling us every day, stay at home, stay at home. Um, we have the Minister of Health, David Clark, actually out there taking his car for non-essential businesses, taking his mountain biking. And so, I mean, you know, it's it's not just one rule for us, one rule for them. It's they have very clearly hammered home this point, and then they've showed us such contempt. Uh, that they don't think that they have to obey the rules, which either means that they don't think the rules are actually, you know, it's all a bit of a joke and they know it, um, or or else, um, <laughs> what else are you meant to think? You know, it, it said it's been a point they have hammered home. It's been there, you stay at home, stay at home. We don't want you going out there. We don't want you gathering groups. And yet, it's clearly, clearly clear that they're actually not following those rules themselves. And again, it's a situation of... Um, you know, how, how are you meant to expect people at the bottom of society to follow those rules when the people at the top aren't thinking that they need to be a role model? Um, so again, getting back to this issue of, the, of what I said before and again about the testing is that um, now just Jacinda Ardern is going out there and going, oh yes, we need to test, 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 and she's quoting the head of the World Health Organization, which is one of the points I had at home last week. 
um, got the CEO of Phillips actually looking at my page. Um, that has moved up in terms of the story that the media uh, picking up and coming was so, so great. Uh, but it's all acting like it's like, you know, she's invented it when actually not. This was actually said from very, very early on the day. And they've actually put it late in the place. And again, you know, this whole issue of, of what I'm talking about is essential basic protocols of, you know, when you when I went to the airport, I walked through the airports. There was nobody at the airports handing out masks. Nobody was uh, sanitizing available. You pick up your baggage off the baggage kit. There's no sanitizing available there. You're going to the toilets. There's no sanitizing available in the toilets. And you're going through each, you know, I went through three basically portals, which were three opportunities to contain it by making sure the, the germs were reduced by putting the product out there. Wasn't there. And as, as again, I say, is it's why not? Because we have known this is a risk and emergency factor this is part of the plan why are the protocols have not been rolled out according to when this event occurs this is what we should be doing and where is this, the supplies for those protocols i'm also actually kind of a little bit reminded too of some of the things that are going on at the moment um during the christchurch uh, shooting we had just about a week or two before we had a symposium called crisis x which was talked it talked about use the phase creating opportunity out of crisis and one of the lines which came out in this the symposium was um how to control a mutiny um and the mutiny was basically triggered by suddenly the people at the top not following normal protocols why they wouldn't be normally following protocols was never actually explained in the symposium but this is what we're seeing now is that there sort of seems to be a lot of again spin doctoring um and using this sort of promote what's going on while not addressing some of these very very serious issues and we are probably going to see the emergence of clusters will start to emerge on i would say will come out of both the uh will come out of first responders because they're the ones that in the risk at the most risk of the other ones that are moving around from place to place and yet they don't have these kits or they are not in the case the police's case is feeling a culture of they have to um wear them and again even though they are wearing which i haven't seen any first-hand examples of to date um there's an the aspect of they're still coming you know when you come to talk to someone about whether they make them safe or, or, or whatever the issue it doesn't mean that they don't they can't stay a, a two meters distance away and talk their issues across you but from what i'm seeing is that no they get you know right in your body language uh so they're actually putting you at risk by coming there to tell you, you know, you have to do that to stay safe as they make it so that you can't be safe. And we're seeing a lot of that go go down. Um, the last thing which I leave you with too is that, you know, we've been told this is a four week lockdown. Um, the emergency services have been told to um, prep for a marathon, not a sprint, meaning that they've been told this thing will go from anywhere from six months to eight months to a year. Uh, this is what's coming out of the international travel that they said this will be a series of lockdowns that come on um, on and off um, which will last over a year we've seen when we look at the defense personnel uh, being deployed um, again it was slipped out that they were told to for a lockup for that exceeded at least two months and again it's interesting because the, the people that were seen deployed who are the specialists are also conducting uh, what I pick up on is the fact is that they're conducting uh, reconnaissance, which indicates that they can see this moving to another phase, and that, that we'll see probably will see um, further issues occurring. Um, the, the final thing which I'll leave you with is that we're they have forecast uh, that we're moving into heavy storm weather during over the Easter holidays. Um, I've been thinking about some of these hot spots that have been appearing that have been, been sent by NEWA, people looking at the NEWA sites, which are, I've gone off and done um, official information act on one of them, and I need to follow up with the other ones, um, showing high signs of basically um, sulfur and uh, carbon dioxide, high levels of, of, of heat. And we, you know, we've been looking at this being possibly because this is, you know, we don't know what they are, but they are currently happening at the same time. We're seeing an increase in uh, temperature increases in uh, Ruapehu. But, you know, if it is somebody, something actually happening where we're seeing, uh, you know, directly intentional heating, like the one that was seen down in Tiano, um, what we, when I think about that in terms of this heat sources, what, you know, regardless of what the heat source is, because we still don't know what it is. The consequence of that will be it'll be actually melting a lot of that snow that's starting to form up in those mountain ranges as we move into winter, uh, making them quite soft. So if we suddenly get 
a lot of rain comes into those ranges, um, what we'll see it will be an increase in in flooding down the Waiho uh, Valley and in those areas, which basically means that we'll then have to deal with a flooding issue, uh, which bear in mind we've already actually had that already this year, and that's, we're not even moving into winter weather conditions, so that's going to put further economic um, and social strain on our system, which is you know already straining under an emergency. Um, my biggest concern, however, of course, is that 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 also re-raised the issue of the uh, 10,000 tonnes of uvea which is dumped in Matura, which is still sitting there and still a, a risk because it hasn't been addressed. And of course, we're seeing all around the countryside that's just one spot. Um, it, you know, what I'm basically saying is we're in a lockdown right now, so we have a shortage of personnel. If we go into a um, it's one of the points I've actually hammered home a lot. If we go into an emergency phase, um, how are we going to cope when we're already actually, you know, we're, we're already running on on a, a skeleton crew? Um, this is going to be very interesting. You know? So that's what I think. Also during the the storming is that we will also see what I'm forecasting. As I mentioned, we will see an increase in um, outages. So again, suddenly people will be going into communications blackouts um, because of of uh, the electricity down, um, no internet. And of course, at the very, very back of all of this stuff happening at the same time is that we've seen the US have already from Space Force in, uh, deployed a satellite jammer, which in January saw, managed to block out an entire area, uh, which is Florida size. Um, that jammer could go either way. That jammer can actually can be something to, if someone is, is actually out, because, you know, there's a lot of politics. We don't know what's going on behind the scenes, but that jammer could be actually jamming them or it could be jamming us. But the point is that we've got another bit of hardware which relates to this whole issue actually already out and play right now. So we need to be mindful of that. OK, that's enough. I'll leave you to it and um, be safe. And again, just put the pressure on. And, and when you're putting the pressure on things like the police and the first responders, um, just be mindful whatever you, you understand about the politics of view towards them is they are actually trying to, to, to help us they are part of our community so any way you can kind of make it get the message through to them in a way where say look you know we're not giving you because it's actually hurting us but we also want to keep you safe um good the more the, the more we can do to actually make them realize they are part of a community i'm sure in the long term is actually will behoove all of us take care and stay safe